Kaziah. She was saying, that, the Lord bless you, amen. She, she got that, God has done something great. I need to be excited about God, the body of Christ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to see you all in the house of the Lord, amen. amen. It's good to see you, Bridget. Let's give Bridget a hand clap. It's been a long time. We haven't seen you or heard from you. But we are, it's good to see in person than hearing on a WhatsApp. Amen. Yeah, wonderful. Welcome uh, back to British Columbia. It's one of our worship uh, leaders, the worship team. Uh, give another hand clap. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I hope uh, you didn't bring the cold weather here. It stopped. Once you cross the British Columbia line, they, it stopped right there. <laughs> Amen. It's good to see you all, and uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord once again to continue uh, the message that we started two weeks, three weeks ago. Uh, three weeks ago, I started on the message concerning the great deception, the great deception. And last week, I, I talked about, I uh, continue with the concerning that and say that there are four things. And I spoke about one of them last week that, who remembers what I spoke about? And uh, not you, not you. <laughs> I saw that you were going to say it, not you. Who remembers? As, instead of other than Alashios, who remembers? Oh, so I work hard and you guys don't remember a thing. Okay, what did you remember? Watch out. Watch out. Symptoms. Watch out for the symptoms, the signs, and then seven. Watch out that when the tribulations and the difficulties and the challenges and the pestilence and the plagues and the deceptions are coming, that you continue to serve God. Amen. Amen. Today I'm going to continue in that respect, uh, but today I'm going to talk about the wantonness. Wantonness. Amen. And we'll get to uh, see what uh, it means to be wanton. Wanton. W-A-N-T-O-N. Wanton or wantonness. Father, we thank you for your great grace that is upon us. Your favor that is upon us. We don't take it for granted that we are able to meet even in the midst of such a time in history as this. And that, Lord, we are under your covering, and your covering has never failed us and will never fail us. I thank you for these men and women, these children and youth and young adults that are courageous to stand with the ministry in respect of what the world is saying. That, Lord, you bless them for their faithfulness. Bless them for the courage in them. Bless them for the confidence that they have concerning your word. Let your word indeed be their anchor. Let your word indeed be, your oh God, their rock, that, or the rock of their salvation, that they shall, none of these shall fall on the wayside in the name of Jesus. Everything about them, Lord, I declare that your word be an anchor to their finances, anchor to their professions, Anchor to the callings upon their lives. Anchor, O oh God, to the blessings that you have bestowed upon them. Those that the blessings that are already come and the blessings that are on their way. That the thief will not be able to steal, kill, or destroy any of these ones in the name of Jesus. Father, I declare by the unction upon me, will Lord, we stood on your word. You said we should never cease in gathering together or assembling together. And we took that word. And we stood on your word, and your word has never disappointed us and will never disappoint us. May this one shine in the name of Jesus. May they rise in the name of Jesus. Where they are weak, strengthen them. Where they are discouraged, encourage them. Lord, where they are, I mean, they are down by one thing or the other, economic, spiritual, emotional, mental, family, business, whatsoever it is, Father, turn the tide concerning these ones in the name of Jesus. And cause them to progress and advance in their studies for those that are in school. Let them have distinctions in the name of Jesus. Let them find favor, O oh God, concerning their feathering of their education. Let, O oh God, promotion come to them that they will get scholarship in the name of Jesus. I declare and release scholarship to them in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's not easy to be standing with crazy men and women. When Jesus' time, he, when he was alive on earth, 
Many people thought he was crazy. When he was speaking of things, they thought the things he speak, was speaking about doesn't make sense. When others are running away from lepers, he was going to the lepers. And leprosy is contagious, but he did not run away from them. When they were running away from prostitutes, that they would come and defile them, he went to prostitutes and stood with them and, 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 and chatted with them, the Samaritan woman. And then she re he revealed the truth for, to her. And that very moment, that woman became an evangelist. She didn't wait for three months to study the scripture. She didn't wait for a year to get to mature in the things of God. She got a revelation and she ran to town. And the Bible said the whole city came. Amen. You have enough to go out and witness. Tell yourself, say, I have enough to go out to invite the city into church. Amen. So you make sure you fulfill that promise. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good. Now, I want us to stand up. Today we're going to do something we haven't done. And I want you to project 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Most of us read scripture. Sometimes we, people will try and say things about scripture that the Bible is written by man. The Bible is just, well, I mean, it's just a story. Please, I want everyone that is able body to stand to your feet, except if you are not able. If you are not able, I command you to rise up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want us to read this scripture together. Amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I wanted to say it two more times. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Last time. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable unto, for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Please be seated. God bless you. This is how scripture came. Scripture, all scripture, not New Testament. There are some of us and some churches and some doctrines that say, well, the, 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 the Old Testament is irrelevant. Now we are in the new dispensation. So only the Gospels and the Epistles play. But according to this scripture, which was written by Paul to the Timothy and to the church, it said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Which means from Genesis to Revelation. Which means God will not give us something that is not useful, but it is still, the, from Genesis to Revelation is still useful. So we don't need to just forget about the Old Testament. Actually, for you to appreciate, for us to appreciate the New Testament, you have to understand the Old Testament. If you, just, if you don't go to the Old Testament, you will not appreciate what is happening in the New Testament. Amen? So I want us, I want to challenge us that as the coming year, uh, uh, the, the new year to 2021 is coming, make it a point to start from January. I want to charge us to start from Genesis. Read two chapters, chapter 1 and 2, and go to the New Testament and read chapter 1 each day. In six months to eight months, you will complete the whole Bible. If you are aggressive, and some of us are fast readers, if you are a slow reader that are like me, just don't rush it, but just take two chapters in the Old Testament from Genesis, and then one chapter in the New Testament. And just do it faithfully, Every, you, it's going to revolutionize your life. Amen. Amen? Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God. For the one? For, the, uh, for, for, for what? For, is it for, 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 to, for doctrine. What is doctrine? Doctrines are things that are taught. That's what a doctrine is. A doctrine is a teaching. Something that has been taught is a doctrine. Therefore, if you don't read the Old Testament that has been given, that has been taught to us, that has been taught to the children of Israel, 
and they'll come and read the New Testament that has been taught by Christ and the apostles, then you don't you really have a doctrine in you. Amen? You have to form a doctrine. If you don't have the sound doctrine, then other doctrines, and you remember, also remember that the world has its doctrines. The world has its doctrines. Demons have their doctrines. Evil spirits have their doctrines. Satan has his doctrines. And if you don't fill yourself with the God's doctrine, the other doctrines will take you and you wouldn't even know it. Amen? So doctrine, for reproof. Reproof is basically, uh, what do it? it means conviction. So scripture is given to us so that we can be taught. Scripture is given to us to be, uh, 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 so that we can, be, uh, and we can teach others. Scripture is given to us so that we can be convicted. When we are taught or when we are, we are being taught, it brings a conviction. And when, whenever we are preaching or teaching and, or you are reading the Bible or you hear the scripture and you get convicted, please don't, don't feel condemned. Conviction is different from condemnation. The scripture is not meant to condemn people. It's meant to convict us. That's what the reproof means, convict. To also, to, the scripture also tests people, tests anything that it says is of God. You understand? If you say you are a man of God, the scripture would, if you don't know enough scripture, or if you know enough scripture, you can be able to use that scripture to test men of God. The Bible says test all spirits. It's talking about the human spirit and even the celestial and terrestrial spirits. Amen? Things of the natural and the supernatural. So if you have the word of God, it tests what comes to you. If somebody is preaching, you can test what they are preaching. If it's of God, you can test with the word. Amen? You have a conviction that this is from the Lord. Amen? And they talk about correction. Most of us today, we don't want to be corrected. Anyone who is a parent, you correct your children. Sometimes the children may think that you are being harsh and hard. But because you love them, you see them going around, you correct them. Not in a wicked way, not in a destructive way, but in a good way. But sometimes they don't understand it. And when they grow up and become parents, then they begin to appreciate parents. How many of us have gone through that? You are, some of you are yet to go through that. You, when you start having your children, then you begin to appreciate your parents. So correction, the Bible is given to us. The scriptures are given to us to correct us, which means we may go away well. We may go in a, be going in the wrong direction, and it brings about a pendulum. It swings us back to the right place. And lastly, it's for instructions. Instruction in what? Righteousness. The, in this world, there's a lot of instructions. From elementary level, they are instructing you to be gay and to be, a, 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 to be lesbian. They are instructing you to be having sex and touching yourself even as a little child. It's in our classes now. Huh? In Canada. And it's okay. And parent, I mean, it's okay. Parent can, so if we don't instruct, that's why it's important we teach our children there. We bring our children to, to church. Sometimes when you don't feel like coming, bring them. Because one, we miss some things. They shouldn't miss it. The instruct, it's instruction in righteousness. So that when they have the righteous, I mean, righteous instruction, where the unrighteous is coming, they can be able to judge. They will have that conviction to say praise, no, 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 no. The spirit would respond. Amen? Today, I'm going to continue. We're going to talk about wantonness. But before we go into wantonness, I want to share a few things about uh, Scripture. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, Watch out that no one deceives you. Which means that if Jesus said that, and if God said that to you and I, it means that somebody is going to deceive you. And because he knows ahead of time, he's warning you. Let's say you, uh, went, to, uh, you went to uh, uh, New Westminster, and then you realize that when you were coming uh, at Patola Bridge, uh, there is a disaster there, and this, the traffic is blocked. And you know somebody that you know that that person is going to come into New West. It happens to me from time to time. My wife will be going somewhere and say, don't take the Patalo, take Alex Fraser because, uh, because I haven't left home yet. And so she's, she's basically saying, watch out, go this other route, because if you take this one, you're going to be caught in there and you can't get to your place early. So Jesus 
has been to a place and he is in the other place where he knows that there are some people that are going to come into your life to deceive you. You may say, well, you can apply in many, many ways. Watch out for businessmen. There's somebody who will come and deceive you. Watch out uh, uh, those that are in the education. The, even in education, you are trying to find the career or profession to get into, and a counselor is counseling you to take a course, perhaps because you are a certain kind. You are not academic kind. They will, though you want to go into academic line, they say go into this place. But maybe not, not because that you're supposed to go there, but because they just want to direct you in a certain realm to keep, keep the, that place busy. You in school, making, I mean, making them money, and you never get anywhere. You understand? So you have to, you have to watch out for these things. There are may, may our daughters and our sons. Watch out. I don't think you got it. Our sons and daughters, watch out. There are someone who will come and deceive you that they love you. Watch out. Jesus is saying watch out. There is someone that will come. And I can guarantee that as long as you are a, a girl, a man will come. And they will come with the right words because they have done their homework. They know that the women, women are, are looking for love and they are looking for somebody to validate them. So watch out for such men. They have nice lips, nice tongue, and they have done their, prof, I mean, they have PhD in rapping. Watch out. And the boys also watch out. Nowadays, women are more aggressive than men. Watch out. The Bible talks and says in the last days, women say, don't worry, I will pay everything. I will make rubies. Come into my bed. Come into my home. I will buy you a car. They are, I mean, more successful than men. And I will make, you don't need to just chill. Just come. You, I mean, let me put you on my Facebook. I'll buy you a car. put you on Facebook. Somebody will say, ah, get a free car. Facebook, don't worry, put me on there. <laughs> Watch out. Amen? Watch out. Jesus said, watch out. We should watch out for one who, one, uh, the one, uh, say one, watch out that no one deceives you. So if we are deceived, it's not that God, you, you, we don't go and blame God. Say, God, how come they took me? Watch out how you, your finances. The hard-earned money that you are earning. There are people that are taught and trained to come and take that money away from you and to say, invest it here, you will make 10%, 20%, and within a short period of time, but they are scheming to take your money. Watch out. Amen? Watch out for relationship. Watch out for finances. Watch out for education. Watch out even in ministry. There are people that come in ministry, they call themselves, they say they are pastors. They say they are prophets. They say they are teachers. They say they are what? And miracle workers, watch out. Watch out. Jesus said in here, for many will come in my name. They will come in the name of Jesus. Who remember what uh, Deuteronomy says about the using the name of God, of God in vain? So we were warned in Deuteronomy. Yeah, that we should not use. I said we will be held guiltless if we use the name of God in vain. But people are doing it. I mean, pastors are doing it. I mean, pro prophets, apostles, people that claim to be, they use the name of Jesus. So you must watch out. Amen. Watch out. Many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They say they are God. They are the Messiah. They are Jesus Christ. And they say we'll deceive many. Today, there are many people in church that have been deceived. There are many people that call themselves and believe that they are Christian, but they are being deceived. Talking about they've been deceived and caught up in relationship that they are not supposed to be. They've been deceived and their monies are taken away from them and they have lost their money. They've been deceived to go into careers that God has not called them into their such careers. They've been deceived into even in ministry. Deceived. I mean, let me tell you a story, a little brief story. Twenty-something years ago, we had a, uh, in a church, we were in a church. I was uh, a leader in the church at that time. 
And there was one brother in the church. He, he, he came with a plan. We were looking. We had about 90000 We wanted to invest to, to grow the money so that we can take and put it down. I mean, I had to buy a place. And then, um, so they said, he came up with this scheme. And the scheme looked good. <laughs> and this is the church. I'm talking about church. Because the deception comes even to church. And the deception comes and take the resources of church. And I'm not going to give you the details, but the point is that this 90,000, we prayed as elders. And what I saw wasn't good. I said, said, no, let's not invest. Though the numbers make sense. I'm a business person. I mean, I, I, I love investment. And I, I, I love investment. But I don't just invest anyhow. But I pray. I said, let's pray. We prayed. Pastor prayed. I wasn't a pastor at that time. Just an elder, a prayer leader. We all pray. We're about seven um, elders. And then we came to make a decision. Everybody said, oh, this is good. We're going to grow it a short time. And the Spirit of the Lord said, no, no, no. Don't go there. I said, you know what? I, I think that we shouldn't do this. He said, ah, I mean, I mean, in the next five years, we'll, we'll grow to this somewhere. Yeah, we, of course, we want to buy a place. We're excited. We know we can grow it. But something within me said, no, no, no. I told everybody. They said, no. And then they said, ah, you, you, you are too hard. <sighs> so we, they took the money. They gave to the guy. Within two years, money cannot be found. 90,000 gone. 25 years ago, 90,000, even today, 90,000 is not a small money. Till thy kingdom come. <laughs> so watch out, church. Watch out. Don't ever, when you have a conviction within you. See, we underplay conviction. But when you know, you have come to a place when you know when God is speaking and something within you, even though your mind is saying, no, no, this makes sense, and this one is saying, no, please, follow conviction. You can't go wrong. It happened, we lost 90 grand. The people's money. God forgive me. God forgive us. I was a leader in that time. I was part of the leadership. So, so you got to be praying for leaders big time. Leaders can be deceived. Pastors can be deceived. Because I've seen it happen several times. Over and over. Now, I want us to look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 16. Open your Bibles. Electronic. Hard copy. Soft copy. Any copy. And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. That I shall have no pity upon them. This was God speaking to the children of Israel. God was warning Israel. God was saying, Israel, when you, I said, I brought you out of bondage from Egypt. Egypt is a place of bondage. I've delivered you and brought you into the, the place, a desert. I'm taking you to a place where you belong. Watch out that when you get there, don't have pity with the people. Don't have pity on the people. Neither shalt thou serve their gods, the gods in small g. Take note of that. Gods in prayer. For that will be a snare unto thee. That will be a snare. See, in, a, in this subject about the great deception and to watch out, um, for, and we, we have to know what, see, what is a snare? It's a trap. There are different kinds of snares. Now, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in the, I was born in the city, much populated than Vancouver, uh, Vancouver uh, the greater Vancouver area, called Accra. And then I was taken to the village when I was nine. And, and it's like there were only at that time probably less than 10,000 people there. And not, the village is actually not up to 1,000, but in the town it's less than 10,000. And I remember growing up and as a farmer's child, my grandparents, your great-grandparents were farmers, my grandparents were father, my parents, I mean farmers, my father was a farmer, even though he was in the city, 
working in a, as a, a, as a, 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 in the university as a chef, a head chef, he still farms in the, even in the city. So I, I, I'm a farmer. I grew up in farming. And in farming, when we want to um, get chicken, here uh, in Canada, we go to superstore and get chicken. And you have meat, you go, you, but, the, but there we have the live chicken. And for us to cut the chicken, we have to use a snare. We have to take grain, like millet, or like corn, or like peanuts. And then you are throwing, and you have your eye on the one you want to get. So you throw, and they all come, you know, chickens. The church Christians are like chickens. You throw something, and everybody put their head in. And they come and they eat, and your eye is on the one you. That's the strategy we use in catching them. The guinea fowls, they are very smart, and they are very intelligent, and they are also fast. If they can fly, the chickens, they can't fly, they have to run. Sometimes we have to chase them and catch them if they, they're smart enough to escape. But the, the guinea fowls, because we cannot trap them that way, we use, we use what? Catapults. Have you ever heard of catapults? Catapult. Catapult is a two bands of rubber that you created with a, 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 a piece of wood that looks like, and then you put it, and then you get a, a parchment and put a stone and then stretch it and shoot it down from the tree. So we have to, inter- that was, we have to force it. So the devil works in many ways for catching, the way he catches Christians and even the church is that he uses snares. The ones that he cannot use snares, he will use his arrows. But may none of us fall to his snare in Jesus' name, nor his arrows. The arrows that fly by night time, that fly by noon day, I mean, the dawn or noon day or afternoon shall not by any means touch any of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Jesus was, I mean, the, uh, God, was spoke, uh, speak, uh, God spoke to uh, Moses, and Moses was communicating to the children of Israel. He said, we'll be caught, I mean, we should, we should what? We should not... Uh, we should not have pity on them. And, but today, in the world today, the church has pity. When God says don't have pity, there is a place to be gracious, to be kind, and to do things that are right. But there are times when it comes to the things of the world, you are not supposed to have pity with the things of the world. Not because those things are powerful. Not because their gods are powerful, but because their gods will ensnare you to leave that which you're supposed to put your focus on into something else, and then you'll forget, or actually, once you take focus off your God, you will defile yourself, then you get into trouble with your God, and then you'll be weakened, because when God's presence leaves you, you are like a prey, like that chicken that we just catch. And guess what? When we cut the chicken, what do we do? We are not just catching it for the fun of it. We have a plan for it. The world is so smart in the sense that the snares they are using, they are using it to get you off so that they will catch you. They will sacrifice you to their God. That's what we used to do because I was born a pagan. We don't just catch chicken. Either we catch it to go and sell and make money to get some money for whatever our parents need, not for us uh, as children, or we are going to sacrifice to our God. And we have to use chickens, and we have to use guinea fowls, we have to use cows and bulls and whatnot. So we have to snare them, catch them, and sacrifice. How, how many of you sometimes think that you are like, you are caught in a place where you can't get free? Though you know that you are, you are not dumb, you are smart, but something is caught you and you can't, you can't be free. It could be some of us, certain characters, certain things we do in secret. Some of them is done in secret so much that now it's no more secret, but we can break free from it. Could it be that you are being snared and you are caught and you are being put on altars that are not supposed to be are you not supposed to be on such altars? You're supposed to be on the altar of God. Amen? Where your life is progressing and your life is free and your life is, I mean, when I say free from, free from anything that can have, we, we are not supposed to be under bondage of anything. Amen? Bondage of 
whatever it is, sexual bondage, drinking bondage, smoking bondage, anything, that, even food. Some of us are under the control of food. If you don't get food, you're, it's like your, your eyes are turning. You are seeing the well, the globe is turning in front of you. <laughs> food is not supposed to have control over us, but we're supposed to have control over everything. Remember when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them what? Dominion. Over what? Over everything. Over everything. Snares. I believe that the church is, I mean, we, if the, the, the world have used snares to get the church and Christians, and we are entrapped. But may God bring deliverance to us in the name of Jesus. Neither shall thou serve their God, for they will be, what? A snare unto us. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 12 says, For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net. Amen? When you want to catch fish, you use a net to catch them. But you know what? Also, when I was growing up, because I grew up as a farmer, other than farming and cutting the chickens, when we go take the kettles and we go to the forest, we go do our thing. We go catch fish so that we, we are there. We have to survive. We have to eat in the forest. We have to take what? Worms to put in a hook, and then we catch fish. Worm is a snare to a fish. But the fish thinks that it's going to get fish, uh, meat. But the fish doesn't know that somebody is standing outside of the water want to catch that fish as meat. The snares that the, the enemy uses is not far from the things we, we use. Money can be a snare. Uh, many, many things. Drinking can be a snare. Friends can be a snare. And I see it in the modern day generation is more so the devil uses friends to snare you out of the church. To catch you away from church. To, to take you away from church. To take you away, away from serving God or doing the things of God. Money. Business. Business can be a snare. Business can be a snare. And you say, well, they're evil. This and then what should we do? You can be in business and not be snared into it. You can be among friends and not, there won't be a snare. See, if you have the word of God in you, your friends can, if they are, Satan is using them as a snare, you can tell. But if you don't have the word, you will not be able to know. If you have the word of God in you, if business is becoming a snare, you can tell. Amen? And you have the power to resist. You have the power to draw yourself out and not let business take control over you or let money take control over you or let friends take control over you and make you feel like if you are not in them, you don't feel satisfied, you don't feel accomplished. You are not, so, not supposed to, be feel, to feel accomplished in money. We are not supposed to be, uh, feel accomplished in things. We are not supposed to be feel accomplished in a person. Even a husband or a wife. Or a friend, or whoever that might be, even parents, we are only supposed to feel accomplished and feel fulfilled in God. Amen? Even though He will use people around you like parents, like friends sometimes, like, uh, I mean, uh, people that, you, I mean, that are close to you sometimes, but they should not become a God to have control over you to dictate whether you should serve God or not serve God. Amen? For man also knoweth not his time, the fishes that are taken in the evil net. And as the bears that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men. The birds that are caught, the fish that are caught in the net and caught in by snares, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, even it falleth suddenly upon them. Praise God. May God help us to not be like any man or like any woman to be caught and be by people's, uh, the devil's net or uh, his schemes. Amen? Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 
Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Which faith is he talking about? The Muslim faith? The Buddhist faith? The, uh, uh, what do you call the uh, Jehovah Witnesses faith? Or the Shintoism? Or all those isms? No, from the faith in Christ. From the faith in God. So many, some shall, some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing spirits. And doctrines of devils. We talked about, when we, when we look at first, uh, second, uh, uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it talks about what? The scriptures, uh, the, the, the God is giving the scripture, all, all scripture is what? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. Now, we are seeing the other doctrine. How many of us in the church that are living, you, we can categorically say that our lives are governed by the doctrines of the scriptures. Our families are governed by the scriptures. Our church is governed by the scriptures. Our leaders in church are being governed by the scriptures. Therefore, they govern the church by the scriptures. When we examine Last week I was talking about trees, um, Christmas trees, not just any kind of trees. And we talk about tails, trees, and transparency. Tails, trees, basically the message on the great deception is about tails, trees, and, and, what? and transparency. Now, talking about seducing spirits, anything that would take you and put another thought in your mind that contradicts God's word. And you know that this is not of God, but it's nothing wrong with it. Let me do it anyway, or let me be doing it because people are doing it because it's become common, it's normal, there's no harm to it. Seducing spirits. Sometimes we talk about seduction by in terms of relation with, between men and women, husbands, married men being seduced by another woman, married women are seduced by another man, and so forth. But you can be seduced by many, many things. You can be seduced by, with money, seduced with position, seduced with, with, with self. When you look at the world today, the self, our self, the self has become the gods that is talking about, the spirits that we're talking about. We are so infatuated with ourselves. Are you getting something out of this? The Spirit speaking, speaking, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and we are in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. I believe that many of the things that are the reason I'm so, uh, 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 so particular about uh, certain things that has infiltrated into Christendom, like this kind of tradition. You know, tradition is one of the keys. Satan uses to seduce people that are, that are religious when in a good way. Really, you can be a religious in a good way, which means following the scriptures and following God in the right way, trying to do your best. It doesn't mean that you get everything perfect, but your heart is I mean, leaning, always looking for ways to improve your spiritual life, improve your relationship with God, improve your character, improve, I mean, and, and, and the tradition, when as soon as you allow tradition to take over, it will seduce, it will, it, I shouldn't say, it's a snare to take us away from the truth. If we are not even doing the truth or trying to do the truth and we haven't mastered the truth, then why do we have, what do we have the time to do, to be Dabbling with tradition. I mean, ask yourself. I mean, we don't even have time to, 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 to delve into the Bible and, and be swimming and be like Ezekiel say what? When God led uh, Ezekiel, the, the, angel, uh, the angel led the, uh, the, the, uh, the man of God uh, into the waters. He said where? He went ankle deep. He went knee deep. He went waist deep. 
He came onto shoulder deep and then got into a point where he was submerging. When you look at your life, our life, where are you in the river? In the word of God. Are you knee deep? I mean, ankle deep? Are you knee deep? Are you waist deep? And if we are knee, let's say we are knee deep. I need to get to waist deep. I need to get to my shoulder deep and I need to be submerged in the word. Now, if I take my time to be dabbling with tradition, do you think I will be able to be submerged? No. But why do we love, why do people love so much tradition? I don't get it. Why do we love tradition? Especially things that are not, I mean, God has not instructed us to do. These things are a snare. These things will seduce us. They will make it look so charming. They are harmless. They seem harmless. But behind the scenes, there are seducing spirits that are operating. Not because those spirits have power over you. Not because the gods that are these traditions have been uh, uh, enacted or established through are powerful than our God. But the point is that they will snare us and seduce us out from God. That's why God warned the children of Israel. When you get there, have no pity over them. Destroy them. Which means anything that has to do... Today we don't go and kill people uh, that are not Christians. But any idea and thought that they bring that are contrary to God, it must be killed. Are you understand? You entertain it. Oh, it's, oh, it's just harmless. It's just fun. Oh, yes. Yeah. They will get you. They will snare you. It's a snare. The parties can be, not all parties, I must qualify there. But there are some parties that are a snare. There are some gatherings among your peers and friends, they are a snare. You must watch out. Jesus said, watch out. So many, many will come and deceive you. And they will say, oh, this is, I mean, they will put Christ's name there. Oh, it's about Christian gathering. Not all Christian gathering that the God is in there. Amen. Not all. I don't. I don't go. I get invitations. I don't go anywhere just because they invite, invite me to go and preach. I love preaching. I love talking about. But it's not everywhere I go. It's not every invitation. I mean, I used to attend certain pastoral meetings. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes I guess are this. Are we really pastors? <laughs> we go there and they are discuss about the the minds of men. We don't even open the Bible. I went there for a few, find a few times. And I advised myself. Yes, pastors, group of pastors. We meet for almost almost a year, and no Bible was open. And we don't pray. We're talking about which latest book have we read? Who, and uh, have you read seen this man's book? And I said, Oh yeah, yeah. I'm, We haven't seen you here, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's not everything that have the name of Jesus in it, or the name pastor, or the name prophet, or the name church. That is all. So you must have the discerning abilities to discern. And I believe that when you feed yourself with the word of God, you can discern. The Bible says, judge all things, all spirits, including the human spirit. Amen? When you go into a church, let the spirit in you and the word in you be able to discern whether it's God is there. If God is not there, maybe it's just that day you didn't feel good, you didn't eat your nice potato, whatever, uh, and, the, and the turkeys and so forth, so you were rough, so you thought maybe the spirit wasn't working. Go there another time, go there a third time, and if it's the same, advise yourself. Amen? If the spirit of God is not in this church, Please, don't come. If the word of God is not, the word we are preaching is the minds and philosophies of men, and, 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 and you are looking for the word of God, then even if it's here, don't come. But if the word of God is here, and the spirit of God is here, and you can identify with it, then by all means, don't miss coming. Amen? Yes. Colossians chapter 2, I'll conclude. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy 
and vain deceit. After the traditions of men. After the rudiments of the world. After the traditions of men and the rudiments of the world. And not after Christ. We as a church are supposed to be after Christ. You as a Christian, you call ourselves, we call ourselves Christian. We are supposed to be following Jesus. Even not following men of God. If the man of God is teaching the word of God, obviously following to learn, but make sure that you don't, that man or woman of God don't become the God, but the way they are preaching, which is Christ, follow Christ. Because that man or that woman of God can fall one day. And if your I mean, the pastor has become a God, you are in trouble. If an elder has become a God, you are in trouble. If uh, any man or any friend or any wife or any husband has become a God, you are in trouble because the Bible says God is a jealous God. Watch out. Amen? God doesn't want to share him, himself with any other. Now, what am, I, what am I saying? Basically, these things that are, the scriptures are warning us to watch out the rudiments, the philosophies, and, and, and all these these things are the vain things, the vain deceit. When you look at the world today, we are falling into vain deceit a lot. The things we are following are deceptive in nature. Watch out in Facebook. Watch out in, uh, you can use Facebook. I mean, I'm not saying, I may mention, some, when, sometimes when I mention things, I'm not saying they are bad. Say like a knife can be good and bad. A knife you use to chop, 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 chop. And make delicious food. It is good. Right? But the same knife that you used to make the chop chop can chop chop somebody. <laughs> then it's not good. Are you understanding? So platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and all those things, you can see if you are wise, you use them to, to when you say, say wisdom, you apply wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge, apl applied knowledge to your advantage. That's what basically what wisdom is. Applied knowledge to your advantage. So use the platform to your advantage. If you're in business, use them. There. But don't let them be a snare to get you caught in them. And then you are sitting for hours and looking at the people with the addresses and makeups. And you become, a, a, what do you call it? Lust takes over. Covetousness takes over. Then in that that has become a snare and it has entrapped you and then you become a slave to it. In that sense, it is bad. Amen? But may God help us not to be caught in that. Wantonness. Wantonness, basically, the, the meaning of there are three things, synonyms to wantonness. Wantonness is depravity. When, when you look at depravity, what is depravity? Depra either depravity or depravity. Depravity is basically immoral, evil. Vice. So wantonness has crept into the church among Christians and we become depraved kind of people. Depra depravity has become a thing in people in Christian life, in, among Christians. So we see immorality in the church. We see immorality. Um, even in pastors. You know pastors that they have, they have uh, a concubine on the side. And they say, well, I mean, Solomon has uh, had uh, 700 w uh, wives and 300 concubines. Are you Solomon? I am Solomon. I don't have three, uh, 700 wives. <laughs> Are you Solomon? <laughs> I only have one wife. I've only known one wife, and I've only been with one wife, and I will be till I die. Amen? Amen? Amen. And I don't, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, let me know go there because we won't finish so immorality, we must do away with immorality from it. wantonness. Evil, there is evil in church. When you are wicked to a brother, a sister, it, you know, do you know that wickedness is evil is wickedness or wickedness is evil? But in the church, there is wickedness. May God deal with us, uh, uh, deal with us in this respect and may none of us be found in this area. The second one is debauchery. Debauchery, sin. One turn means depravity. It means debauchery. 
And also debauchery means sin, it means iniquity, it means what? Wickedness, it means corruption. As a man and woman of a child of God, our hearts should not be corrupt. Our hearts should be pure and just. Amen? Towards mankind. Not only in the church, outside of the church. You, should have, you have a just heart. You should have a pure heart. You should have, don't be caught in the world, the vices of the world, which we just spoke about. And lastly, dissoluteness. Dissoluteness. Dissoluteness is self-indulgence, and we can identify with that. We are so, in, we are so into ourselves that we don't have room for anybody. Self-indulgence, whether it's in food, whether it's in many, many, they include greed. Self-indulgence over indulgence, everything is to the extreme. Look at the world we live in. Man, man, we are, things are getting grosser and grosser and grosser. They, I mean, when you do, we see something and you are thinking that you want to do it, and before you know it's even ten times more they are doing it. And then we want to chase after the wind. And we get involved with this self-indulgence. Recklessness. And then wastefulness. May we rise to our feet. And just talk, talk to the Lord. I want us to pray that and ask God. Or talk to God. God say, wherever I've been ensnared and I've fallen to the snare of the devil, release me. Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Wherever you have been ensnared and entrapped and you are caught in anything, we are declaring today that you will be released. Church, take a, we will take a minute or two and just pray. I want you to talk to God yourself and then I will declare release in the name of Jesus. You know where you are at. I know where I am at. I don't know where you are at and you don't know where I am. But I believe that there is somebody and some people among us that have fallen into the snare of the devil. And we don't even know it. We, we, may, we, may, we know that something is wrong, but we don't know what, that, what it is that is wrong. You are in, you are being entrapped. You are being snared. And you are caught into the philosophies of men. Vain deceit. You're caught into the, the I mean, the, 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 the in, I mean, self-indulgence, in, overindulgence, and many, many things, wasteful life, wasting your time. In things that don't matter. But you feel that if you don't do those things, I mean, you are losing something. You are missing something. These are the things that the Bible, Jesus said, we should watch out for, so that we will not be deceived. For many, many will come and deceive us. Many will come and deceive us. In the latter days, we will be deceived. Pray that you will be broken off the lip. I mean, you'll be liberated from deception. The spirit of the le- deception. The snares that are set, you'll be liberated from the snares of the devil. Mental snares. I mean, emotional snares. Spiritual snares. Physical snares. Wherever you are caught, we declare you liber- liberated by the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we declare liberty over you. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, Thank you for your word that has come to us. Your word has uh, uh, made it clear that we should, be, we, should be, we should watch out. For many will come in your name to deceive us. They will come and say, claim that they are, they are, they are, they are, they are uh, followers of Christ. They will come that they are men of God. They will come that they are women of God. They will come that they are children of God. They will come that they are investors. They are interested in our life. They want to help us, to promote us, to help us grow and develop. But they are, they are coming with the, uh, the snare of the devil to entrap us. Father, with the, I declare everyone and anyone in this room, including those that are on, online, watching and listening from near and far, we declare you losing in the name of Jesus. We break the snares and destroy and demolish their strongholds. Uh, where you have been gripped and you have been wounded, I declare healing over you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're welcome, brother. Let's take this time, just as we're going to give our tithe and offering unto the Lord. Uh, we're going to pray and let's prepare our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for this time, oh Lord. 
Father Lord, we pray as we come before we give with our tithe and offering. We pray, oh God, as we give, may we give with a cheerful heart because you love a cheerful giver. And bless each and every heart and each and every hand that is going to give unto you, oh Lord, this afternoon. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And to the Lord be thy glory. Great thing he has done. And to the Lord be thy glory. Great thing he has done. And to the Lord. Today's your first time to worship with us. On